Hi teachers, this video is going to talk about the crucial role of repertoire in your teaching. I'll explore some of the complex psychological and cultural factors that are subconsciously involved. Our key figure here is Pierre Bordeaux and he was an ethnologist, sociologist, anthropologist and education theorist. Again, you can see how a lot of these fields will naturally overlap. Now, his key work came in 1977, and his key ideas thread around the ideas of cultural and material factors which contribute to educational environments, and ultimately, motivation. As you can see here, he sums up his own work in his own words. The point of my work is to show that culture and education aren't simply hobbies or minor influences. They're hugely important in the affirmation of differences between groups and social classes and in the reproduction of those differences. Now, how does this relate to us? Well, you might be surprised, but repertoire has an incredible influence on the way students learn. His general ideas stem from the ideas of Karl Marx and Marx's theology. And he extended key principles of class and identity and extended these principles further out into education in the way students think, in the way students behave, in the way students learn. And we've got a crucial role in the way we use and impact upon this within our repertoire. So the key idea here is cultural capital and how our teaching and lessons are drenched in cultural capital. Cultural capital is the knowledge, attitudes, values, languages and tastes of students and what they actually value as skills within their society. And this is where repertoire links in. How does a student value the repertoire that you've chosen? How does that repertoire make sense in their world, in their culture? This is what Pierre Bordeaux calls habitus. So how do you access the student's habitus in terms of repertoire and how do you access their dispositions of student culture within their own cultural perceptions? And just to simplify that in normal language, we're actually talking about how cultural capital refers to the knowledge and skills that students find valuable. For example, learning Mary had a little lamb for a 15 year old boy is definitely not high cultural capital. Learning the same techniques, the same three finger positions, perhaps learning Shape of You by Ed Sheeran, will result in extremely high cultural capital. And this naturally impacts on motivation in an intrinsic sense. And here you have that same 15 year old boy. There he is, lovely. Now, how are you going to motivate this boy? You've got extrinsic factors, things like dojo, praise, points, rewards, but in fact, we know as teachers we use both, but in fact the best teachers use intrinsic motivation. They develop intrinsic motivation in their students through very high quality lessons. I keep mentioning world class and I'm going to keep mentioning it. World class lessons, well planned lessons with brilliant repertoire. This re results in much higher levels of intrinsic motivation. A sense of curiosity. Within three to five lessons, you could probably get a child playing shape of you, double-handed on a keyboard, no problem. You could also do that on the ukulele, no problem. Rather than Mary had a little lamb. This sense of curiosity around the repertoire naturally pushes them to want to practice and want to learn. This naturally impacts on self-actualization from Maslow's hierarchy from video number one. When students start to feel a sense of, wow, I didn't think I could do that you see the levels of intrinsic motivation go through the roof. Now, not all students will be intrinsically motivated. Many are, and many are in this school. Some might need external factors first, dojo, etc. But think about repertoire. How you can inspire students. Do your own arrangements. Write your own curriculum. Simply following a book for every student is going to get low-level outcomes. To get these impressive learning outcomes, we need to think about the capital benefits of every piece of repertoire that we're going to give a student. How do they value this repertoire? What does it mean to them? To understand what it means to them, you need to understand the student itself. You need to understand the student cohort themselves, what they're like, what they're interested in. 
They need to know what skills they find valuable, how they can enact these skills within their cultural habitus, and in doing so, understand how they identify with this music and what it means to them, the symbols and meanings within the music, what it means to them in their community, their school, their family, and how other factors of capital link in beyond social capital. Anybody who's been trained in the Kodai method, the Hungarian composer and educational thinker, his entire concept of habitus and field was based around folk music. He felt that every child knew folk music and would immediately identify with this music. Some modern criticisms of the method are in fact just this. What is folk music? What is the music everybody knows? What is common and vernacular to every student? So what is folk music? What is common music? What is vernacular music? How does the student identify with your repertoire? This image sums it up perfectly. The teacher teaching on the board is boring stuff. In the student's head, in his world, is thinking about forms, technology and other things. How do you access this world through your repertoire? How do you differentiate for every student that comes in through the door? How do you differentiate and personalise every single curriculum for every student that comes in? How do you teach canonically? If you're teaching a genre, what is the basic canon within that genre? Canon meaning the best possible example. If you're doing a reggae piece, then you should of course be looking at Bob Marley because he's canonic. That's the highest possible example. So if you're teaching through genres, you need to teach children canonically through the highest possible forms of art within that genre.